tries to quiet the criticism. I don't think anybody could have predicted that these people would take an airplane and slam it into the World Trade Center, take another one and slam it into the Pentagon, uh, that they would try to use an airplane as a missile, a hijacked airplane as a missile. But Condoleezza Rice is wrong. Had she looked, Dr. Rice might have found in the files of the intelligence community what the 9-11 Commission would uncover. The attack she deemed unimaginable had in fact been imagined repeatedly. Planes either packed with explosives or otherwise. Twelve times in the seven years before 9-11, the CIA reported that hijackers might use airplanes as weapons. The most specific of those warnings involved this man, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, or as the spies now call him, KSM. After evading capture for years, KSM was arrested last year in a middle of the night raid. This is how he looked when he was handed over to the CIA. In custody, KSM has talked. The results of his top secret interrogation shared with commission investigators provide a chilling map of the road to 9-11, as well as a surprise. KSM not only imagined the unimaginable, he engineered it. In early 1999, bin Laden summoned KSM to Kandahar to tell him that his proposal to use aircraft as weapons now had al-Qaeda's full support. In terrorist circles, it is even called the planes operation. KSM met again with bin Laden at Kandahar in the spring of 1999 to develop an initial list of targets. The list included the White House and the Pentagon, which bin Laden wanted, the U.S. Capitol, and the World Trade Center, a target favored by KSM. The brainstorming about an attack on American soil began almost a decade before 9-11. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and his nephew, Ramzi Youssef, thumbed through photo albums of American skyscrapers. We were looking for symbols of economic might, KSM will admit. February 1993, just one month after Bill Clinton's inauguration. It is Ramzi Youssef, with financing from KSM, who parks a rented Ford van loaded with a 1,500-pound chemical bomb in the underground garage of the World Trade Center. The massive explosion kills six people, but it fails to bring the towers down, as Yusuf had hoped. It is the first warning shot. Yusuf escapes to plot again. 17 months later, he and his uncle, KSM, travel to the Philippines to carry out a scheme they nickname Bojinka for Big Bang. Bombs are to be placed aboard a dozen U.S. 747s, jumbo jets, timed to explode simultaneously as they fly over the Pacific. With 400 passengers on each plane, more than 4,000 people would die. But as Yusuf and another terrorist are mixing chemicals to make the explosives, a fire breaks out in their apartment. Police arrive and discover a bomb factory. Yusuf once again escapes, but his laptop is left behind. And the outlines of the plot were found on the computer, and it was a breathtaking plot. It was in its audacity. Steve Simon, who worked in the counterterrorism security group on the National Security Council at the time, testified before the 9-11 Commission. If it weren't for the accidental discovery of the fire in the apartment, that slaughter that they intended to carry out in the skies over the Pacific would have happened. One Bojinka conspirator is arrested, and he reveals a second, more audacious plot. A plane filled with explosives will be crashed into the CIA. They also want to hit the Pentagon, but as he will complain to interrogators, they need more pilots. It is an early blueprint for 9-11. Someone else has imagined the unimagined. But I want to say one thing to the American people. Clinton's credibility is crumbling, his again. judgment suspect. I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. The intense partisanship of the period, the 9-11 Commission reports, will affect the future use of force against bin Laden. And I need to go back to work 
for the American people. Thank you. The prevailing reaction to these strikes was huge blunder, wag the dog, and so forth. And that reaction, and the prevalence of that reaction, tended to blind the American public. And the people, you know, who shape the public's opinions tended to blind them all to the fact that we were facing a serious, lethal threat. December 4th, 1998, President Clinton gets a stunning piece of news. In his daily briefing, what's called a PDB, the CIA tells him that bin Laden and his cohorts are preparing to attack inside the United States, quote, perhaps including an aircraft hijacking. Two weeks later, CIA sources signal an opportunity. Bin Laden will spend the night in the governor's compound in Kandahar. The uh, intelligence officer in charge on the ground thought we would uh, be lucky ever to get that quality intelligence again. The field officer insists, hit him tonight. We may not get another chance. But the pending impeachment trial has cut Clinton's room for error. If there is collateral damage, if civilians are killed, he will be branded as reckless. With his weapons locked and loaded, the U.S. military is ordered to stand down. Clinton did sign covert guidelines directing the CIA to go after the al-Qaeda leader. But the agents could kill bin Laden only in self-defense as they tried to capture him. It was always easier to have killed him. It was never permissible by uh, uh, the people who made the policy decisions. The administration is gun-shy. CIA officers fume. During the worldwide search for Millennium Plotters, the CIA had pumped sources whose links to Al-Qaeda are known to be notorious. They learned that suspected terrorists will travel to Malaysia in early January 2000. The spies identify Khalid al-Midhar and learn that Nawif al-Hazmi is traveling with him. What they do not know is that KSM has called a summit to map out the 9-11 attacks. Malaysian intelligence catches the men on camera and sends the surveillance to CIA headquarters. The CIA obtains a photocopy of Midhar's Saudi passport and discovers he has a U.S. visa. It was considered interesting, the head of the agency's counterterrorism team will tell the commission, but not heavy water yet. Remarkably, Midhar is not added to a terrorist watch list. When the Malaysia summit ends, Midhar and Hosmi, traveling under their own names, fly to Thailand, seated side by side. And there, the CIA loses them. The two men, sworn to bin Laden and martyrdom, book a direct flight from Bangkok to Los Angeles. Undetected, they land in the United States on January 15, 2000. Using their real names, they rent an apartment in San Diego and obtain California driver's licenses. They even live for a time with an active FBI informant. But the CIA has not bothered to give the FBI their names to check. Neither the informant nor his FBI handler has any reason to suspect them. October 12, 2000. Two suicide bombers in a dinghy packed with explosives brush the side of a U.S. Navy destroyer docked in Yemen. The blast rips a 40 by 40 foot hole in the USS Cole. 17 U.S. sailors are killed, at least 40 injured. Bin Laden would recreate the attack and use it in a video to attract recruits for his jihad against America. They humiliated the greatest power on earth and the greatest power on earth couldn't find a way to respond in any way at all but instead talked itself into paralysis because they couldn't find a smoking gun um, uh, to identify the people who were claiming to have done it. Although the attack bears al-Qaeda's signature, the CIA and FBI refuse to formally declare bin Laden the culprit. The U.S. does not hit back. Al-Qaeda's planes operation is now deepening its roots on American soil.